so on. So I don't want to start with COVID. I want to go back uh, to your know, early days growing up. What was that like from uh, growing up and you know, the usual stuff that young people have to deal with, career choices and, and uh, failures and things not working out as you thought it might. Uh, you can start from wherever you want. Okay, so listen, uh, my, my father was in the government. Uh, he was a doctor, a dermatologist. Yeah. Uh, my mom was a homemaker. Uh, now, so we grew up in uh, government colonies by and large in Delhi, right? I have an elder brother. I have an elder sister. And, uh, you know, my brother and I went to the same school. It's just that he was seven years older. And so we went through the same teachers and he would always come first in class. And, you know, I, in my life, in my entire academic life, uh, school, college, I am, I have never come first in life. First so in class. Brother I, always came, came first. Yeah, yeah, my brother was this uh, academic outlier, right? And he would come first. I mean, you know, when, when he came second, it was like, uh, my God, what happened? And, uh, you know, I never came. So I went to the same teachers and, uh, you know, they would compare and they would say, my God, your brother was so good. And look at you. Now, it's not that I could not do well in studies. It's just that I never worked hard enough. Right? I was not interested enough. Uh, I was more interested in, you know, sports. And other stuff. Not, that, not that I was great at sports, but, you know, I was, you know, I, I would sort of do many things. And I, but when, the, when it came to the exams that counted, you know, I managed to do well enough to achieve my goals. Whether it's a class 10 board exam, uh, or it was a class 12 board exam, or the IIT entrance, or the CAT, the IIM entrance, uh, I managed to get through to wherever I wanted to go to. Was right? there a strategy behind it? Was there a delay? No, I don't think there was a strategy. I think, I think look, uh, we grew up in a middle class family, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm sure many people in the, who are listening today, who are watching today, will be from middle class families, right? And if you've grown up in a middle class family in India, in urban India, uh, you know, and uh, you know, your father is, and your parents are probably in salaried jobs, very often in the government, public sector, army, you know, civil services, police, railways, whatever, uh, you know, nationalized banks, national insurance companies, uh, academics. One of the things that you're constantly told is that son, uh, you know, there is no, nothing to inherit, there's no family money. Right? The only thing we can give you is that education. But the yeah. doors will open only if you work hard enough. Right? And I mean, that, that, so that message was pretty much clear. Right? Uh, and so when it, when, it, when it mattered, right, that message was there. That, listen, this exam I have to do well. So this exam I should shape up for. Uh, now, therefore, I would not study hard out of habit or every day or every test or every exam but it's about, prior, it's about prioritization and can i i will continue this i just want to note that you know i've always seen you reason like this even today do you think you were always born do are people born with this kind of thinking or you can develop this over time you think but in that one year see when you're faced with an existential crisis you think a lot Hmm. And I thought deeply over the next one year when I was in class 12 and said, you know, why do I want to be an engineer? Do I know what an engineer does in his job? Hmm. And I came to the conclusion that I didn't want to be an engineer. I just wanted to be an IITian. Ah, you wanted I was chasing a brand. I was joining a club. I wanted the label. I wanted a bright future that that brand would give me. I wanted the doors opening that an IIT stamp would enable. Right. So I wrote the IIT entrance exam again. Uh, I got in again, but I also got uh, admission to St. Stephen's College Economics. Hmm, because now you had the class 12 marks and yes. you used that. And I said to myself, now I had done science and biology, so I was clueless about economics. Uh, and I had. Uh, but I was also reasonably clueless about engineering. <laughs> and I was generally clueless about life. I knew what I wanted to do eventually. But, you know, the steps there, I was, you know, so look, most of us, when you pass out of school, are usually clueless. Yeah, that's right. Right? Uh, you know, our uh, decisions are poorly researched. And I was no different. So for all the viewers out there, you know, if you're young and clueless, it's okay. You know, 
keep on drifting, keep on searching, keep on seeking, find your calling. It's a part of growing up. It's a part of coming of age. And that's life. So it's okay to be clueless for a while. But where does the confidence to break that Sanjeev come from? How, how does one think? It, does it kind of happen naturally? Do you have to make somewhere you have to break from that, you think? No, so, so it's like this. It's about how clear you are about an alternative goal. Now, I did not grow up in a family where there's anybody who's an entrepreneur. The greater family. Everybody was in the government. Mm. Everybody was an engineer or a doctor. Mm. We were not brought up to be entrepreneurs and take, you know, take a chance. We were brought up to study hard, get into a good college, get into a post, good post grad, get a good job, either in government or in a private sector, and have a somewhat predetermined life. Mm. So, was there another existential crisis after the uh, after the Stephens? So, uh, yes, uh, this was. Uh, so my brother, who went to IIT Kanpur, did computer science, then went to IIM Ahmedabad, uh, and he graduated with very high GPAs in both places and in the top five or something, in both places. Uh, you know, he got a job uh, in a company in Bombay, which uh, as a systems analyst, and he was body shopped into the US. Mm. And after one year in that job, he says, I don't want to do this. Mm. And he quit and said, I will do a PhD. And he went to the US to do a PhD, uh, you know, from Stanford University. And the day, this is, uh, I had just joined college. And he and three other friends, he had called three other of friends of his who were classmates from IMM Ahmedabad for lunch that day. And all four of them had quit their jobs and all four were going to do PhDs. Uh, from the US, uh, one at MIT, one at Cornell, you know, I mean, great universities, they were bright, bright, very bright people. And they were all in Delhi because they had visa interviews I see. that day. Okay. Uh, and uh, I asked them, look, why are you doing this? Why are you chucking up great corporate careers? And, uh, you know, why do you do an MBA in the first place? They said, we have made a mistake. Uh, for us, the MBA was an extension of college. Uh, out of the sense of herd mentality, we did this. Of course, we've worked one year in the corporate sector and we've figured out we don't want this life. And so we are quitting to do something we really want to do. And uh, then they said something very important. They said that the best business schools in the world, and you know they're counting the US business schools, the top ones, Harvard, Stanford, MIT, you know, Water, Kellogg, Cornell, as the best business schools in the world, 95% of the class has prior work experience. It's only in India that you do an MBA straight after college. Uh, because it's an extension of college. Now, if you work in the corporate sector for a few years, two things happen. Number one, you're clear if you want this as, as a career. Number two, the MBA is not an extension of college or school you make a lot more sense of your MBA if you actually had work experience. Because you can relate to what's being taught in the classroom, you can relate to it much better if you actually had organizational experience. And which is why the best business schools in the world don't take too many people straight from college. Mm. And now that made a lot of sense to me. So like I chucked up IID went to Stevens, that bit of logic made sense to me. That I will get more out of my MBA if I work for a couple of years and then do it. So, but there weren't too, but there weren't too many options out of college, in Delhi University, those days, to actually work. But you chose again a non-conventional alternative, Sanjeev, just as you had done. Well, I, I, I think I think this is good advice that I got. Sure. Sounds and, advice. And advice from somebody who was walking the talk. Right. He'd done an that, MBA as an extension of college, say, look, I made a mistake. So you listened to them? Yeah. So, so now in third year in college, I uh, wrote the cat 
and I applied to four companies. There were only four companies that came to campus for hiring. Because in those days, you couldn't get a job after college unless you were an engineer. A BA could not get a job after college. It was not a professional course, right? Uh, as luck would have it, uh, I got into an IM and I got a job. And then I went through this thing again. Should I take the safer option? You know, what if I don't get an MBA after two years or three years? Uh, what if I'm out of touch with studies and I can't clear the cat again? Right? I had got a good GMAT score. I'd written GMAT also. And I said, you know what? I'll apply abroad. If I get a scholarship, great. If I don't, I'll write the cat again. And I took the chance. So you have been a risk taker. You have been a risk taker in this. No, time. actually, I'm, I'm, quite, I'm quite scared of risk. I don't take risks. I'm very safe. What I do is I uh, try and understand a risk. I try and mitigate it, manage it, reduce it, break it down. And then if I'm comfortable with it, then I take it. I'm not a natural risk taker. So it's a myth that, see, successful entrepreneurs, according to me, are not risk prone. They are risk averse. It's just that the, that the goals are different, but they will still take the lowest risk path to achieve that goal. Jumping ahead, so you got into IIM again. So you got into IIT twice and IIM twice. Yeah, but this time I went. Yes, this time. So out of four times, there is one time you did. I went and uh, again, and I am was a great experience, right? And uh, uh, now, in the in the eighties, in the IIMs, companies went there to hire management trainees. Yeah. Right? So you joined at the entry level as a trainee. I had worked for three years. I th I thought my work was relevant to a career in marketing or to a job in marketing. So I didn't want to join as a trainee. I wanted to move into marketing. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, I said, why should I write up three years? So I went outside placement. Now the placement rules were that you could uh, apply it for a job yourself directly to any company that was not coming to campus. I see. Right? Now, I had applied to all the relevant companies uh, which were coming to campus, but I put a rider on my application form. I don't want to join as a trainee. I want to join laterally. As a consequence, nobody shortlisted me. So I didn't get a single interview call in the placement process uh, at IMA. Right? So now the placement process you know, starts off three months before the companies actually come. So I, I knew two months before that I wasn't getting interview calls. Nobody had shortlisted me. Right? And so I went, I looked at the, I went outside placement and I identified one company that I was interested in, which wasn't coming to campus. And this was a company called HMM, which is now called GlaxoSmithKline. And uh, they, had, they had brands like, you know, Horlicks, Boost, Brill Cream, Eno. And uh, I wanted to go to Delhi, back to Delhi after working in Bombay and you know studying in Ahmedabad, because I said I want to be an entrepreneur after a few years. So let me go back to Delhi. Uh, I will stay with my parents. I'll save some money. Then maybe I can start a company. Uh -huh. So that's how that. So I applied for that job, and uh, I was called for an interview. And to Delhi, I came over for a day. I got the job and uh, I came back to campus and I went to the placement chairman who was a professor. And I said, sir, I have, uh, I'm opting out of placement. Uh, in any case, I'm not be shortlisted for anybody, any interview, but I'm opting out of placement formally. So he's, I've got a job. He said, which job? I hope you haven't got any rules. I said, no, no, this is a company not coming to campus. They're great. So now you're volunteering to help me for placement. And he kind of uh, forcibly volunteered me. So I was now helping him in placement. <laughs> okay, and there were two other people. These are people who had taken deferred placement. They were writing the civil service exam. And they said, Ki, so now deferred placement, you can come back next year in case you don't 
get clear the exam. So they were also volunteered. So the three of us were volunteered to help in placement. So our job was that of a concierge. The recruitment, the companies will come, you will meet them at the gate, you will escort them to the interview room, you will make sure tea coffee biscuits are served, you will make sure the interviews are lining up on time, you will see, you will take them for lunch, then they'll, they'll come back, then you'll make sure tea coffee biscuits are served in the afternoon, then you will see them off at the gate at the end of the day. Right? Uh, so all the interviews on day one of placement were happening in 10 adjacent hostel rooms, dorm rooms. Right? Uh, so all the students were milling around outside and the three of us who were coordinating and okay, your turn here, your turn there, now you go here, this, you know, all that was happening. Now, Citibank had come, now day one for the best companies, the most wanted companies had come on the first day, students vote. Students vote for who comes on day one, right? So this is 89, pre-liberalization. So none of these, you know, uh, you know, investment banks and VC firms or, you know, uh, uh, funds or consulting companies like McKinsey, none, none of that. The day one companies were Citibank, Bank of America, Hindustan Lever, and Procter & Gamble. Okay. Two marketing, two banks, right? Uh, Citibank had come with, four, with, with eight interviewers. So they were running four interview panels. Lever, however, had only come with four interviewers. So they're running two panels. <laughs> so the lever head of HR who was there, he got worried. And he thought that Citibank will process candidates faster than me. They're running four panels. They will make final offers. And these guys will accept and drop out of placement and won't even do a final interview. So what he decided to do was completely against placement rules. So placement rules were that you can get up to two offers. If you get two offers, you're out of placement. If you accept any offer, you're out of placement. If you get, get one offer accepted, you're out of placement. You can sit on a, a one offer that you've got for 48 hours, I, after which either you accept or it lapses. Hmm. So he, if he liked a candidate across the table in 10 minutes, he began to make offers across the table. Here is a offer letter. You write the guy's name, signed. You sign accepted right now, and you walk with me to the placement office, inform them that you're opting out of placement, and don't go for the city bank interview. <laughs> so this completely threw the entire placement system out of gear. So students were upset, they were being forced to sign an address, some guys wanted to sign, some didn't want to sign, some ran away, some tried coming back. The city bank guys found out what was going on, and they stormed into the lever interview room, and they almost came to blows, and they were screaming and shouting. <laughs> so that night there was a GBM held and you know all students, all profs, and everybody screaming and shouting. And so so that year the entire placement system went out of gear. Rules were changed, you know. Uh, but why I'm telling you the story is from here I got my first product idea. Yes, I have to say that, yeah. I figured that listen, uh, the phrase war for talent was coined much later, or I heard of it much later, but I had witnessed it. Mm. Citibank and Lever executives coming, almost coming to blows and, and you know, swearing at each other at the top of their voices. Okay, uh, you bloody so-and-so, you can't do this, you know, all sorts of things, right? And these are guys who knew each other, they were all alumni of IMA. <laughs> They're free. Okay, so uh, I said to myself, look, if, if companies are fighting like this, to recruit talent at the, at IMA at the IMS, if somebody were to do a salary survey of what companies are paying fresh MBAs from the IM campuses uh, and price it reasonably, it could be sold to many companies. Mm. A year later, I quit my job and that was the first product. And was that Nokri or was that another? No, no, no. no, no. The company is called InfoEdge. Okay, it's not 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 really. Okay, Infoed launched a salary survey of what companies are paying fresh MBAs from campus, and we just went to our junior batch, my junior batch, and said, "Show us your offer letter." Yeah. So in those days, there is no such thing as privacy, data privacy. 
you know, it was all public information. <laughs> so we just got salary data, 135 companies. Sorry? We got salary data of 135 companies. 135 companies. Right? Uh, we had no money. Uh, because I, was, I had not saved any money. I had spent it all. You know? uh, and uh, in those days, the computer cost one and a half lakh rupees. It was four years salary for a fresh MBA. So I went to a friend in whose office there was one computer, 15 people sharing it. And I said, I want to access to your office computer. He said, here's a spare set of keys. You can sneak into my office at 11 p.m. and leave by 4 a.m. And you can use the computer. And nobody will know. And that's what we did. We wrote the report. We took one master printout. And then we put together a mailing list of, uh, by looking at appointment ads, obtained back issues of newspapers and magazines from the JNU library. And uh, we uh, sent letters to 600 HR managers. Mm. Saying we have this survey. It's 3,500 bucks. Just send the money in advance. We'll send you the report. This is a list of 135 companies that we've covered. Wow. And in three weeks, we had collected 81,000 rupees. We didn't wow. have an office. We didn't have an office. We had used my former partner's residence address. He lived in Masantya. I lived in Trans Samana. This is a more market address. We use his address. <laughs> we used to sit at the dining table and clear out when his mother wanted to serve lunch and then come back in the afternoon to sit again. And that was the office. And that's how we started. So we started with 2,000 rupees and this became 82,000 and that multiplied. But, but the important point I want to make is that uh, if I look back on it, the key learning from this was that what I say to all young entrepreneurs today, that successful businesses are built on deep customer insights. Deep customer insights about what? About an unsolved problem, about a gap in the market. Right? If I had not witnessed that fight between Vincent Lever and Citibank, I would never have understood that if you do the salary survey, it will sell. Now, if you solve an unsolved problem and you've got knowledge of the unsolved problem through a customer insight, and that customer insight is first-hand knowledge by observing a customer, maybe you're a customer yourself, right? Then you don't have to sell. The customer will buy. Mm. And then you will get your terms of trade. You will get the price you want. And you will get your money in advance. Just one letter, just informing the survey is available. No meetings. The DDs and checks came by courier. These days, Sajeev, everybody is talking about big money, raising money, you know, build millions of dollars and so on. And, and there is heightened uncertainty. Now, if you look at what we are facing, so much more uncertainty and crises. How do you navigate to a time like this? So on one hand, there's everybody's growing big and you have to talk in terms of... No, I think, I think the environment is changing. I mean, money is not going to be as easily available uh, as it was till before COVID. Yes, some will still get it and some will still get big money, but those will be very few. And this is the other thing I tell entrepreneurs, that the customer's money is better than the investor's money. Because if you're getting the customer's money, you can be very sure you're creating value. Because the customer will not give you money easily. And if you're creating value, then the customer will buy again and again and again. Right? If you're getting the customer's money, then you will get the investor's money. Because investors love to invest behind companies that are getting the customer's money. But if you get the investor's money first, there's no guarantee you'll get the customer's money. Because getting the investor's money the first time is about impressing two MBAs across the table who are maybe in the mid twenties and or late twenties and perhaps have never run a business themselves. Hmm. So if you get the customer's money, if you get the investor's money, your PowerPoint is working. If you get the customer's money, your product is working. Hmm. Make your product work. 
and beyond in a more general sense sanjeev what tips would you have for people to deal with uncertainty in general see we've dealt with change in the past so this is the fifth or sixth down cycle in my career in 1990 when i quit my job it was a down cycle uh vp singh had just become prime minister and he made that famous statement coffers are empty and we had india to pledge its gold that's when i quit my job mm. in 96 there was a second recession mm. and 97 we launched nokri 96 97 we had 40% degrowth in the company 40%. but because 40% degrowth in the company wow but because we had kept costs low right and i simply if i didn't take a salary we were breaking even hmm and we launched nokri so nokri was born in a recession in response to a recession right i became an entrepreneur in a recession we raised venture capital in april 2000 15 days later the, the dot com bubble burst right yeah we went pub we went public in 2006 in 2008 lehman went down our stock price tank 75% we are a public company by then and when how, they- how what is happening right now is unprecedented so all of these were sudden shocks but but a, 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 an economy being locked down for 3 months is a lot tougher than anything we faced earlier mm. and this is across all sectors it's not you know earlier you had sector specific problems so dot com versus a dot com burst global financial crisis financial crisis some industries still okay right now everything is in trouble now what it means for young people who are looking for the first jobs uh and those are people i speak to first because you know they probably joined their colleges and business schools and whatever else uh, you know with great hopes and aspirations and suddenly 3 months ago everything changed so what i would say to you is that look this is most unfortunate but you really can't help it so first thing is accept that the world has changed second thing is what figure out what you can do best to mitigate your situation now most of us who graduate from college usually have general skills uh i would say acquire one narrow deep expertise in addition to that a narrow deep expertise for which there's a market or with their jobs available if not now then 6 months from now how do you determine that do you have insights on that people are figuring out uh, you know uh, so, I, so let me give you an example if you are good if you become really good at social media marketing hmm okay right? that's a skill that will that will be required by organizations for the next few years to come but you got to be really good at it now you can become really good at it in two ways do one or both do a course read a lot study a lot about that and get some professional practice so you may have thought you were going to get a job paying you x amount in a large organization that you had dreamt of now suddenly you have to switch to hey the next one year i'm going to be an apprentice i may or may not be paid but in that apprenticeship i will specialize in something i will learn a skill so work for free if required but pick up a skill become good at something and become good at something that is going to be in the and therefore after one year you can go to another company and say i'm good at this they'll take you hmm. right now what are you good at the truth is most of our college you know we are nice guys we are nice people but what are we really good at 
that one thing that one thing where you can say i'm better than any middle set if you if you fail to achieve your goals after a lot of effort is it good to change how do you change when do you change when do you know to change your goals so i would say first of all you know if you're being an entrepreneur right keep your goals simple and understand it's you're in for the long haul right i bootstrap for 10 years before we got venture capital then we went to a meltdown and i was in trouble for 4 years again so 14 years it took me mm. to actually say we are now financially stable wow now if you're lucky 5 years if you're unlucky 20 years <laughs> so uh you know so a, a friend of mine said you know that luck is about being at the right place at the right time mm-hmm. right to which he added uh, but if you are in enough places enough times and for a long time sooner you or later you will be at the right place at the right time <laughs> that's nice so hang on in there keep trying kabhi na kabhi achhe nahi aayenge 